Good evening, everyone. In 2016, a Brazilian judge ordered the arrest of Facebook's vice president in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The reason? WhatsApp refused to hand over messages pertaining to a drug dealing investigation. WhatsApp couldn't, literally because of encryption. I'm from Brazil. My name is Mariana Valente, and I'm the director of Internet Lab. Today, I'm facilitating the session about threats to encryption in private messaging around the world with Will Cathcart, the head of WhatsApp, who I'd like to welcome. So welcome and thanks, Will, and thanks everyone who's watching. Imprisoning the VP of Facebook is probably one of the best known cases illustrating the tension between encryption advocates and law enforcement. Since then, WhatsApp has twice been blocked around, across the entire country of Brazil for similar reasons. Law enforcement asking for WhatsApp message content that could not be accessed. These are times of intense and unprecedented, unprecedented global challenge to global health, as well as to democracy and human rights. Digital technology are central to these challenges, causing renewed and lively discussions about encryption and private messaging. So to warm up, what do you make of the situation, Will? How do you perceive the value of encryption to rights with the perspective that we're hearing a lot about these days that it somehow compromises or interferes with security or even public health? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mariana, for posting this conversation. And you know, thank you, everyone who's listening in for all the work you do to protect human rights. I, we're excited, or I'm excited about a, a, a human right we hold dear at WhatsApp, uh, and we think it's increasingly important in the digital age, which is the right to have a private conversation online, just as private as you would have had it in the real world. Um, you know, you mentioned public health, and I think it's important to note that you know, the coronavirus has changed our world uh, in a lot of ways, but one way it's changed it is forced us to have conversations digitally that used to be in person. You and I are talking over video today instead of in person, and all of rightscon has been over video and remote instead of together and physical. And I think um, what we're seeing is an acceleration of the trend that our lives are happening online and things we used to be able to do face-to-face, -face, we now do digitally. We've certainly seen that at WhatsApp. In, in April, we saw a large increase in usage of our services, over 100 uh, billion messages being delivered a day, over 15 million minutes of voice and video calls. Uh, and we've done what we can to support that from the reliability of the service to expanding features like allowing group calls of up to eight people, um, as well as you know partnering where appropriate to offer services like health information lines from the WHO or domestic violence abuse lines in Argentina and Chile. So victims who are stuck at home could reach out and get help. Um, but the most amazing thing is not sort of you know what we've done or the, the overall usage numbers. What's most amazing is the stories of how people are communicating digitally doctors having sessions with patients digitally instead of in person, lawyers doing their work remotely, there have been stories of courts in Brazil and India using WhatsApp to conduct court business. And I think the you know, important question for our age is, um, are we gonna live in a world where that's possible, where you can have those conversations digitally? We don't think it's an accident that people have felt comfortable doing that these last few months. We think it comes from an ability to trust that the technology is keeping those conversations private very, very, very sensitive conversations that you wouldn't be willing to have unless you knew they were private. Um, and you know this, and many of the people listening know this, but we use a technology called end-to-end -end encryption that secures that, that gives you the confidence that no one can hear your messages but or hear your calls. But for those who aren't familiar with it, um, what end-to-end -end encryption is, is it's a technology where if you send a message to someone or you say something in a call, it's scrambled from when it leaves your phone to when it gets to the recipient. And no one along the way can listen to it or read it not even WhatsApp. Um, and we think this is critical. If you're going to have a really important, sensitive conversation digitally, you need to know that no one can listen in. Um, and this is important online because, as we all know, there are growing numbers of threats to your conversations. There's hackers, there's criminals, but there's also foreign intelligence services and governments around the world who want to snoop in on what people are doing. And end-to-end -end encryption protects people from that. It protects whistleblowers when they talk to journalists. It protects um, journalists in general. Um, in places where freedom of speech is at risk, vulnerable communities everywhere, at-risk groups and oppressive regimes. Um, so we think it's really, really critical for all the reasons, all the types of conversations we're having digitally, and especially for groups that are, um, you know, laboring to advance the cause of human rights. And unfortunately, as you mentioned, kind of the theme of what I'm hoping to talk about today, this is, this is under threat. This is not a given that we'll be able to offer services 
uh, that companies will be able to offer services that contain the level of security of end-to-end -end encryption. Governments have advocated against this for a long time. Uh, you mentioned some of the history in Brazil um, of going back the last few years, but even more recently in Brazil, there's discussion of a law that would require a concept called traceability, um, letting uh, requiring companies to help trace who started a message that ended up getting forwarded on. Um, in Australia, the UK, US, there have been various discussions around you know, attempting to force companies uh, to lower the security they offer or even legislate against it. Um, and uh, we think this is a really, really important decision. Um, we feel very strongly that we need to offer the most secure product and we feel very strongly that's the right thing for the world. Um, and in part, what we're hoping um, to help raise awareness around is that this feels new, this feels like a new debate because it's a digital space, but it shouldn't feel new. What we're really just debating is, should you have the right to have a private conversation with someone or should technology break that? Because we've had private conversations for all of human history. And the fact that we're now having them digitally is just a change of technology. It shouldn't change our rights. Um, and we think when you think about it that way, when you start to think about, you know, what would make sense in the real physical world, the answers become obvious. For example, we're reaching a point as a society where you could build the technology to put a, a camera with a microphone in everyone's living room all around the world hooked up to a central server somewhere so that governments or law enforcement could access them to watch in a room if they thought a crime was going on. Um, and everyone would recoil at that idea. You know, certainly everyone here, and I think everyone in almost any context would listen to that idea and say, that's insane, we wouldn't do that. Yet somehow when we have the conversation around the digital world, it feels new, so it feels like a fresh debate. Um, and we don't think it should. And so you know, I, I think what we're really trying to do is raise awareness that these debates are going on um, and get you know, many, many, many people have helped make the case uh, about the important freedoms at stake here, but help make sure that everyone who can is raising their voice to be really clear so we make the right choice for, for society. You're saying about the importance of private communications for social movements, activists, lawyers, vulnerable communities, and so that a space of non-surveillance can exist in the digital world. But I guess we need to dig a bit deeper into the reasons why governments and law enforcement oppose encryption, right? So when we look at the grounds on which the legitimacy of encryption is challenged around the world, we see that the narratives have developed differently in different jurisdictions, right? We see talks in the US and the UK around national security and the investigation of crimes, especially terrorism, drug dealing, sexual abuse. We see certain encrypted technologies banned in China, for example, on the grounds of controlling speech, I guess. And more recently, disinformation has been a concern driving discussions in Latin America and India, for example. So can you speak a bit on about the different region, regional trends that you observe around the globe? And I guess it could be interesting if you could also comment on the differences or similarities that you see from supposed democratic countries when compared to more authoritarian ones when it comes to how they approach the regulation of encryption. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the most important thing to, to focus on is exactly what you bring up, which is this debate is going on all around the world in a bunch of different countries. And we shouldn't make the mistake of not realizing that that debate's having in different places, even though it sounds different, um, because the threat is the same. And what happens in a specific country around encryption could impact people in other countries. You know, for example, you know, the debate in the US around legislation on encryption wouldn't just affect people in the US, it would affect people all around the world if they happen to use any service um, where the, the company or provider provided by is subject to US law. Um, similarly, you know, a lot of places around the world, as you mentioned, have talked around the edges of end-to-end -end encryption. They haven't wanted to come out and say end-to-end -end encryption itself should be illegal or should go away because they haven't wanted to sort of, you know, openly kind of say they would want that big of a trade-off to people's privacy. They've danced around it with suggestions of, okay, let's let's require the collection of more other types of data. Oh, we still think end-to-end -end encryption is okay, but here's a set of changes you need to make. Um, but I think the reality is that the the growing loud debate in Australia, the UK, and the US has emboldened people in other countries who might not have wanted to openly challenge end-to-end -end encryption to now challenge it more forcefully. Um, and I think that's a problem. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, lastly, I guess the, the, the point I'd make, you, you, you talk about the difference kind of between, um, you know, more, more liberal democratic societies with a history of rule of law and, and respect for human rights and more authoritarian ones. You know, one problem is, is we're no longer living in a world of um, separate communication systems by country. Um, we're living in a world of global communication. And if you, if you propose weakening security in a, um, you know, a, a, a West, uh, a democratic, liberal, human rights, uh, traditional country, the reality is one, people in that country are gonna be subject to surveillance and spying from authoritarian regimes. You know, if you live in the United States, the reality is some parts of your personal information have likely been stolen by people working for the military in China. You know, I mean, even just the Equifax hack, for example. Mm. Um, and I think if there were a hole in your communications, you would absolutely expect spying from all around the world. And two, you know, if you, if you create a hole in a country with strong rule of law in a global communication system, it's going to be an issue all around the world because every government's going to ask to use it. They're going to ask and do everything they can to try to get access to people's private conversations. And I think that's really bad. Hmm. Just a follow up question on that. Uh, one of the arguments we hear often from law enforcement is the going dark argument, meaning that investigators are left with no evidence if all communications are encrypted. What do you make of that argument? Yeah, thank you for bringing it up, because I, I think it's really important to talk about that. You know, when it's framed that way, obviously, a lot of people hear that and say, well, well, gee, I don't want law enforcement to have no data. I don't want it to, the world to go dark on them. That sounds bad. But it's just it's just not the reality. The reality is not that law enforcement is somehow living in a world that's going dark. I would argue law enforcement is living in a world of kind of a golden age of surveillance. There is more data about our lives online captured by the devices we carry around with us than ever before. You know, here in the US, law enforcement can go to phone manufacturers, go to Apple and Google and with a warrant saying, tell us everyone who is in this geographic location at these times. That's a thing you never would have dreamed up before. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that private messages, messages you send to one other person, private calls you have with one other person are so sensitive that they shouldn't all live on some server somewhere, that that's just too big a risk to take with people's privacy. Um, and, and, and yet, that doesn't mean that law enforcement is going to then live in a world where there's nothing. It's just not the reality. Hmm. Well, uh, thanks. Going back to that talk about local regulations, um, I think many here know, and we'll mention it already too, that we're currently discussing a fake news bill in Brazil. And one of the things that the current version of the bill addresses is investigations in private messaging. And this process seems like an interesting hook to a few discussions that we could have here. So there's a considerable concern in Brazil at this moment that WhatsApp and other messaging apps that deploy end-to-end -end encryption have been central to disinformation campaigns in recent years and elections. Um, a few stakeholders have been drawing on a distinction made in the literature between private communications and mass communications, arguing that such apps have the protection of private communications, but they have actually been serving as broadcasters of information to the public and information that goes unchecked and is untraceable. So what do you think of this? What's your take on this distinction and what what's up serving to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we really agree with the distinction between private communication is different than sort of a public forum broadcast medium. Um, you know, we, we think of it that way. We think of WhatsApp and private messaging is different than a public social network like Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Uh, and we think people's expectations are very different, right? They know that if they're saying something to everyone and they know everyone in their network, that's different than if they're messaging something to one other person or having a call with someone else. They expect much higher levels of privacy there. Um, and yeah, I mean, there've been, there've been real legitimate questions around, you know, even though WhatsApp was designed and intended as a private communication medium, did some of the feature set mean it could be used, uh, more as a broadcast one? Our solution to that is to say, we should change the feature set. You know, we really believe this should be a private communication service. Um, the overwhelming majority of messages are one-to-one -one messages, but let's change some of the functionality. So we've done things like limit, 
um, who you can forward to. I think this is, you know, more since the last election in Brazil, for example, you can only uh, forward a message at once to five other um, chats rather than kind of unlimited. And much more recently, actually in April or, or, or May, um, uh, you know, with, with uh, the rise of coronavirus, we decided to make a change where if you forwarded a, messages, a message and it's gone more than five hops, it's been forwarded my, more than five times, there's no quick forward button. Uh, you have to kind of hunt around to find the forward functionality. And if you do, you can only forward it to one person at a time. And there's other limits, like groups can only have 256 members, et cetera. But in general, just trying to change the product to be a little more, um, uh, to match kind of the private communication medium we intend it to be. And the second is, you know, go do what we can with the data we do have to root out some of the bad behavior. For example, there, you know, were stories of politicians setting up, you know, thousands of fake accounts uh, with their political operation to get a message out. Um, and we're now using uh, patterns of behavior and automation to find uh, and ban those accounts. We now ban over 2 million accounts for spam and things like that each month. Um, but what we don't think is the right solution is to go mandate that the privacy and security for everyone just goes down. Um, we think it's much, much better for people to have a true private communication medium that stays private. And the other thing I'd say about you know traceability in Brazil, just because you brought it up, and I think it's a really important topic for everyone here to understand, is you know that the concern around misinformation is, is real and legitimate. But the solution being proposed is pretty scary. It's the idea that if the police think that someone forwarded something on that was fake, they should be able to track down the people who shared it um, and go talk to them. And just, I mean, just think about that, right? Like the idea of someone coming and knocking on your door and saying, you shared something that's fake or uh, dangerous or untrue uh, to, to one other person. You, know, you messaged one other person with it. That's pretty crazy. Um, and not to paint too dire of a picture, but they're pretty clear examples of that leading to you know horrible regimes all around the world. I mean, in in China, for example, messaging works very differently. The messaging services there are monitored. What you you know they do look for you know quote unquote misinformation or fake news as defined by them. There's been a ton of reporting on this about how you know with the with the coronavirus appearing in Wuhan, a lot of really really brave doctors shared information about what they were seeing over messaging. Um, and in some cases got kind of in trouble or told that what they were doing was destabilizing or fake and they shouldn't share it. And it was only because they persisted uh, and, you know, found used code words and found clever ways to get the information out that it did get out. And I don't, I don't think mm -hmm. we want to live in that world. Um, and there's got to be, you know, other approaches that are much more reasonable for helping to dispel rumors and get accurate information out. Yeah, good. Um, I think it's a good idea to go a little bit deeper into the traceability requirement that's being proposed in the Brazilian bill. Um, so the idea, it's a very controversial proposal. It stems from the idea that law enforcement has to be, ma to be made able to identify the source of match messages that are broadcast, as Will were saying, right? But using metadata retention. So what it requires is that messaging apps retain data on who forwarded a certain message and when under certain circumstances that would characterize mass forwarding. But some of us stakeholders, including myself, are deeply concerned about how that could lead to mass surveillance and enable new forms of political persecution and moreover be ineffective. So you were mentioning the China case, but um, I wanted to hear from you two things still. Um, how do you see that traceability duties that require just metadata retention, um, if there's no provision on disclosing the content of communications, how would that affect users' privacy? And the second thing is, one of the things that's being discussed is that this would be data that WhatsApp already collects so I think one important thing for you to, to, to talk about would be what's the scope of metadata that you collect and already provide to law enforcement worldwide? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the most important thing about the data we have is that we what we don't have, which is the, the content of the messages, the calls, the video chats you make. We can't have it because of that encryption. But yeah, we do, we do have some data. Um, our philosophy is to be as minimal as we need to be to collect and kind of reliably run the service uh, and keep keep it you know secure and safe. But we do have some things like, for example, IP address. But we don't have anything near um, what's being asked in the traceability legislation, which is why we're fighting it. Right? It's why we're fighting it, is we don't want to collect this data. You know, for example, we don't have 
um, a way to look up if, if someone brings us a message, who's the person who sent it. And we don't, we don't even have, you know, who are all the people, everyone on the services message. We don't, we don't have that data and we don't want to have that data. And so I think the, you know, the main takeaway here is I think to be wary of legislation, uh, of, of regulation that would require companies in general, messaging services specifically, especially to collect data they don't want to collect. You know, we don't want this data. We don't think we need this data. And we don't think you should want us to have this data. Okay. I'll go back to this, but I just wanted to um, ask something else regarding what you were saying uh, about government spying on doctors, for example. You gave a very concrete example of uh, government spying on people, the case of doctors in China. But speaking of that, um, of other governments around the world, I understand that one of the issues that WhatsApp's dealing with right now, for example, in the NSO group lawsuit is spyware. Can you speak a bit on the state of that worldwide? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we've been, we've been really public around this. We found a, you know, found a vulnerability, uh, that was being exploited, um, by a spyware organization. We fixed did the, the obvious thing. We fixed the vulnerability, you know, investigated, reached out to the people we think had been affected by it. Um, but we, we felt we needed to do more and we've, we have filed a lawsuit against NSO group. I can't get into a lot of the specifics with them because of the lawsuit, but let me just talk for a second about the industry and the trend here. Cause I think it's really important and in particular, really important for this group. There is this growing industry of companies that create hacking software, spyware and sell it all around the world. Um, and this, this software is horrifying. You know, it exploits vulnerabilities in your phone operating system to let the person spying do unbelievable things, you know, not just read everything on your phone, but like, you know, potentially turn on the camera silently, turn on the microphone silently, track the physical location of the device at a distance, get alerts if you go to a specific area. It's pretty horrifying. Uh, and the industry says they do this for legitimate law enforcement purposes. You know, they talk about fighting terrorism, et cetera. But the research on this is quite clear that in practice, these tools are not being used for that. They're being widely abused. You know, there's research with Citizen Lab out of Toronto. It's really, really, really amazing work. Um, it's tracked a lot of this down to who are the actual people who are being targeted. And it's just horrifying examples of journalists, human rights advocates, um, you know, government officials, uh, religious leaders, just kind of people, you know, a lot of people all around the world who are fighting for human rights and democracy being targeted um, and being spied on in really, really horrifying ways. And so we think this industry is out of control. Um, I think governments should be stepping in to stop it. Uh, and more broadly, you know, for everyone here, want to make sure everyone knows this is happening. So, you know, one, you can keep yourself safe and learn what you can do um, to protect yourself. And two, you know, help, help as best you can create awareness and pressure that this is completely unacceptable and it has to stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're unfortunately heading to the final questions and I think it's essential to finish this interview by addressing some hard questions. So I'll start with the first that has been voiced by civil society and the technical community who see end-to-end -end encryption as a tool for furthering human rights. So just to make sure we're speaking of people who support encryption. Uh, but the question is, as WhatsApp moves to this direction of incorporating new services such as pension and insurance in India, or what's at pay in different countries? Are we talking of a model that would require more metadata retention to work or even the integration with other users, user databases such as Facebook's? Uh, how to deal with the fact, for example, that WhatsApp and Facebook seem to rely on very different principles around data collection and use and don't you see that as a contradiction? Yeah. Great question. So I, I think, you know, on, on new services we're going to build and offer, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. They, they, they'll, they may require different functionality or even, act, even different pieces of data. Our philosophy on it's going to be the same, which is, you know, how do we offer a great service with the minimal data we need? How, we, how can we be really clear about that? Um, and so I think you'll see, yes, for example, uh, with things like payments, you may need to enter some of your, your, your credit card or debit card or bank information um, that you're, you know, to connect with your bank. But we'll build it in such a way as to minimize uh, what we have, and we think it'll be reasonable, and we think it'll be good for the people who want to use it. Um, but the more broad one you brought up, I think, is, is, is 
you know, thank you for bringing it up. I think it's, it's a really great example. We think of, you know, we think of a public social network and a private messaging service as different. We think people have different expectations for them and they should. And it, it is not a contribution for a private messaging service to be really, really, really private. Um, and Facebook's had that position for a long time. That's actually why, you know, after uh, Facebook acquired WhatsApp, WhatsApp went and built an added end-to-end -end encryption with Facebook support was uh, it felt like the right model for private messaging. And I think that, you know, the final thing, one of the beauties of end-to-end -end encryption and beauties of building a service that's really private is we kind of agree. You shouldn't have to trust uh, the service provider you're using, be it a company or whoever. You just should know that they don't have your messages and you shouldn't have to worry about it. And so one of the great things about end-to-end -end encryption is it just removes that need to trust, that need to worry about, it, you know, even just a mistake or a, or a hacker getting access to your messages because it's not possible. Hmm. Thanks, Will. And speak addressing now the, the second question, which I think has to do with how to trust that you don't have to trust. Uh, the technical community often voices that secure end-to-end -end encryption requires free or open software so that one can be sure of its working through auditing, for example. So why has WhatsApp not moved to that direction? Yeah, great question. I mean, you're absolutely right. You, you need to have a service where people can trust that they don't have to trust, so to speak. Um, and, and open software is a great way to do that. In fact, we use the uh, signal protocol for end-to-end -end encryption inside WhatsApp, which is open. Um, and that, that's one great technique. And I think there's others too. You know, we, we've done white papers, for example, on how our technology works. We benefit a lot from the scrutiny um that we receive as a as a really really popular app you know anytime we release a new app into the the play store or the app store researchers go look at the binary and study it and i think you know I, I'm, I'm confident that if they, they would be able to detect any sort of um any changes in how we were implementing encryption etc um so i think but i think there's you're right there's a lot of ways to build trust here and over time you know we should look at more of them whether it's opening up more of our software um more scrutiny third-party audits etc um, and I think you'll see us do that over the next few years as we build more functionality. Good. That's really good to hear. And Will, we only got two minutes left. So do you want to finish by saying how you see the future ahead in terms of encryption and challenges to encryption, please? Your last minutes. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I don't know. I'll tell you what I hope, which is I hope that, um, you know, one of, one of the small things we'll realize out of this year and how much we've had to have all of our human interactions digitally is just how important this is. And that that will create the awareness to make sure governments protect our right to private communication rather than try to undermine it. You know, I was struck by seeing a, an image of a, a cabinet meeting in a democracy that was held over video conferencing software. It wasn't WhatsApp, it was you know a different service. Someone tweeted out a photo of a grid of all these government leaders. And I, I thought to myself, my God, that better be end-to-end -end encrypted. It's a cabinet meeting of a, you know, a government. Like, that's a huge security issue. And so my hope is this is gonna raise awareness and people are gonna realize and make the right decision. Uh, and we'll get to enjoy for the next generation or more the, the, the privacy we've had with private communication that we've enjoyed before the world went digital. Okay. Thanks, Will. Uh, let's hope. Um, I thank you very much for this conversation. I think it's been very enlightening. Um, and I really hope we move to a future in which encryption is understood as a support for rights, um, fundamental rights, and that we get out of this current situation we're in uh, at a better place for technology policies. So thank you very much. Thank for thank you everyone who's watching, and see you around. See you next time. Yeah, and thank thank you so much, Mariana, for this conversation, and for everyone watching. Thank you for the chance to talk about this, and thank you for everything you do to protect all of our rights.